Uh, welcome back. Uh, we have been uh, trying to establish a connection between topology and uh, condensed matter systems and um, in general we have done that for uh, quantum mechanical systems such as electrons or uh, the Aronov-Bohm phase that uh, uh, is uh, you know in the vicinity of uh, a solenoid. It is an additional phase that uh, an electron can pick up. Uh, we are uh, now more into uh, these uh, the connection to condensed matter physics and uh, let me start with a topic which is uh, quite important for understanding the later parts of this uh, and it has been used heavily in the study of condensed matter and it is called as a second quantization. Uh, we will have to understand these um, the way the Hamiltonians are deformed etc and why we bring in the topic of topology. Uh, so, first we have to learn how to write down the Hamiltonian and these uh, 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 techniques of second quantization will aid us in doing so. So, we will start with second quantization that is a formalism and uh, this is a very in important formalism in uh, the study of uh, either you talk about condensed matter physics or quantum field theory. Uh, it is uh, very similar uh, notations are used quantization ok all right. So, we uh, this would be also interesting because we would like to write down the Hamiltonian uh, in the tight binding form uh, most of this Hamiltonians that we write later on uh, would be uh, having a tight binding form and then we will see that uh, uh, how a system is topological. Uh, the parameter uh, regimes in which it becomes topological and the properties that uh, come along with ok. Uh, so, why is this formalism important uh, in general? Uh, so, we are talking about uh, many particle systems ok. Which means uh, it consists of uh, many particles and uh, these are identical particles ok. This is the main assumption of quantum mechanics that uh, the particles that we deal with uh, cannot be uh, distinguished one from the other ok. So, they all are absolutely identical and this identical nature uh, creates a problem and in the in the following sense that uh, when you uh, swap two particles that is exchange two particles. Uh, the resulting wave function uh, picks up a sign or may not pick up a sign depending on whether they are fermions or bosons respectively ok. So, uh, if you have more than 2 particles that is 3 particles. So, you have to keep a track of uh, uh, 2 such swaps or exchanges and 3 such uh, or rather uh, one swap is uh, swapping uh, say A and B and the other swap is say swapping um, A and C or B and C and so on ok. So, let us just talk about 2 swaps um, in a 4 particle system there will be 3 swaps and so on. Each time you make a swap and you are dealing with fermions then you have to change the sign um, in the following sense we will just show that. So, this becomes a big problem to deal with a large number of particles and uh, we often have to deal with large number of particles because the formalism of statistical field theory uh, demands that we are actually talking about uh, uh, macroscopic number of particles. So, that the statistical mechanics um, that we are familiar with can be applied. So, in that context uh, we need to uh, evolve a mechanism where such swaps uh, between particles uh, and the corresponding changes sign of the wave function can be incorporated. So, let us just talk about um, one um, you know a particle to begin with. Uh, let us say the, uh, the state of the system is um, determined by these alpha 1 ok. And if you are talking about n particles, so this for one particle and say for n particles we will have uh, alpha 1, alpha 2 and then alpha 3 and so on and say uh, so we are dealing with n particles and alpha n ok and this will form a state 
okay, a complete set of states and so on. So, this will form the Hilbert space. Now, can we simply multiply it uh, to write down the resultant ket that is whether this one is a possibility. the inner product states and so on. Okay. So, uh, this is incorrect because of the reason that this does not uh, give rise to the these uh, permutation of particles or exchange of particles. So, we will see how. So, let us talk about just two particles to make matters simple. Uh, so, the either for fermions or bosons. Uh, we can write down the resultant state as uh, say psi is equal to uh, we do the normalization as well and we can write it down as um, uh, say uh, alpha 1, alpha 2 uh, and uh, plus minus alpha 2, uh, alpha 1. Okay? Uh, this can also be written as 1 by root 2. Uh, alpha 1, alpha 2 uh, plus minus uh, alpha 2, uh, alpha 1 and uh, uh, where the plus sign refers to bosons and the minus sign refers to fermions. Okay? And 1 by root 2 is the normalization factor. Now, um, for two particles, we start with the single particle uh, states which are alpha 1 and alpha 2 and uh, form the complete set of states for these system of two particles which are uh, coming as um, you know uh, plus or minus of when they are the order is reversed. So, alpha 1, alpha 2 and alpha 2, alpha 1 and so on and so forth. Okay? And you can do it for three particles, it is going to be uh, complicated and uh, you will have uh, probably six terms and so on and you will have a 1 by 2 factorial here, there you will have a 1 by 3 factorial which is 1 over 6 and so on and so forth. Okay? So, for n particle, uh, it is quite difficult to write down the, uh, the state psi and uh, because all these combinations that come uh, because of these various swaps that you do, uh, that is very difficult to keep a track and um, uh, write down a sort of wave function in this particular fashion. So, what I said is that uh, you cannot uh, simply write it down uh, as alpha 1, alpha 2, etc. as a ket and uh, pretend that that is a, a many particle wave function that you have to deal with. You have to deal with something much more complicated than that. Okay. Um, and as I said that uh, the plus sign which means that uh, the bosonic wave functions are symmetric under the exchange of particles whereas the fermionic wave functions are anti-symmetric which means that they pick up a sign uh, as you change uh, these uh, two particles and uh, you make one more change uh, uh, then it re uh, returns back to the same state. What I mean is that if you have uh, three particles and you take 1 to uh, 2 and 2 to 3 then uh, it does not pick up any sign because there are two minus signs that are being picked up. Okay. So, uh, this problem is actually arising because of the indistinguishability of the particles. So, this wave function that you see here uh, because of the indistinguishability uh, you have to take combinations, but that is indistinguishability also gives you or rather it provides you a solution as well. Okay? And that solution is provided by um, going into a Fox space and uh, this is uh, discovered by V. A. Fock was a uh, Russian uh, mathematician. So, uh, we will uh, discuss very quickly what Fox space is. And um, if you need to understand what uh, Fox space is, let us just, just talk about uh, um, bosonic system just to begin with. So, that because the fermionic system uh, the number of particles is uh, 0 and 1. So, I already gave you the answer that will not uh, really worry about uh, that which state uh, to put a particle in. Uh, so, we will just worry about uh, how many particles are there in a state. So, we will go from these uh, uh, you know representation of putting a particle in a given state to count the number of particles 
uh, corresponding to a given state and this is called as a fox space okay so it's also it's called as a occupation number basis and so on um, so uh, let us say that uh, we have a quantum state suppose a quantum state is 1 1 uh, 1 2 2 2 3 3 4 5 6 and so on okay uh, so uh, which means that uh, the uh, you know there are these particles uh, is uh, there is three quantum states uh, containing uh, one particle three quantum state containing um, two particles um, and uh, two quantum states containing three particles one quantum state containing four particles one five and one six and so on and so forth okay so uh, and uh, this is like a, a sort of a huge you know redundancy in its uh, in its representation it will be much better if we just uh, number these states in the occupation number basis and write the state in terms of uh, how many particles in a in a given state so we'll just count the number of particles n1 n2 n3 and n n so uh, this n particle uh, so there are these uh, subject to of course these things that uh, n i so i equal to 1 to n has to be equal to n okay so this is the total number of particles so uh, the fox space has n1 particles in uh, state 1 n2 particles in state 2 and so on just like uh, you know there are three uh, uh, particles that are uh, there uh, three quantum state correspond to one particle and so on okay uh, so this is a this is called as a uh, fock basis and this will help us in uh, writing down a, a second quantized hamiltonian let's see how okay so ni uh, can be anything for bosons okay so this is an important point and n i is equal to uh, 0 and 1 for fermions okay so either uh, a given quantum state can have uh, uh, 0 particles that is no particle and or it can have at the most one particle okay we are not talking about spin at this moment but uh, that can also be incorporated. Um, so, uh, this is uh, basically it provides you of course, a simplification in writing an n particle state and uh, but then uh, we still are not sure that how this representation is uh, doing justice to this exchange of particles or the swap of the particles and let us see how that is uh, being done. So, so that is done by using uh, creation and annihilation operators. Okay. So, these uh, are represented by the creation operators are represented by C dagger. Um, it can be A dagger or B dagger depending on uh, sort of notations that are used by various authors and the annihilation which is also called as a, a destruction operator uh, this is represented by C okay and uh, so how what does this do uh, this really does this so it is C i it acts on these fox space which contains n 1 n 2 n i and n n so, this is nothing but equal to 1 minus n i and minus 1 whole to the power epsilon i. I just tell you what epsilon i is and uh, n 1 n 2 n i plus 1 and n n. Okay. So, uh, what it does is that it increases the number of particles in the ith level by 1. Okay. So, this is what it does. 
and in the process it picks up uh, this factor and this factor. We will just tell you in a moment what this uh, factors are and uh, you have a C i that is uh, this is for the creation and this is for the annihilation. So, C i n 1 n 2 um, n i n n this is equal to n i into minus 1 whole to the power epsilon i n 1 n 2 n i minus 1 n n ok. So, what is epsilon i? Epsilon i is uh, a quantity that uh, considers this swap. So, it is a sum over all the n j's prior to uh, that i. So, this j runs from 1 to i minus 1. So, you count all of them their occupancies we are uh, particularly you know writing in terms of uh, you know fermions such that uh, so these are for fermions. We are not talking about bosons, uh, but they can also equivalently be done uh, provided uh, you uh, do a symmetrization of the wave function. This is um, very specific uh, to the nature of fermions and bosons. The fermions obey an antisymmetric property whereas, the bosons obey uh, symmetric uh, property wave function is symmetric under the exchange of particles ok. And this is one of the reasons that uh, the fermionic wave functions are written as later determinants um, because you know the properties of determinants are that uh, uh, if you exchange a row uh, and a or a column uh, that is you exchange say third row with seventh row and so on uh, or you exchange uh, a fifth column to fourteenth column uh, for a for a given determinant, it uh, picks up a sign, a negative sign. You do two such swaps, it uh, picks up uh, another negative sign, which means the net sign will be positive. And uh, very importantly, if you make two of the rows or two of the columns identical, then the determinant is equal to zero, which is uh, related to the exclusion principle Pauli's exclusion principle which says that uh, no two particles will be allowed to um, occupy the same quantum state ok uh, with all their quantum numbers to be identical ok. Uh, we are at this moment we are not talking about spins, but if they have different spins then they can occupy ok. So, epsilon i which is there in the exponent of this minus 1 whole to the power epsilon i. Uh, I mean uh, minus uh, 1. Uh, so, it is in the exponent of this minus 1 that uh, takes care of these swapping of the particles ok. And um, uh, these uh, 1 minus uh, n i in this uh, expression for the creation operator that you see it, it um, ensures that uh, if the particle already has uh, an occupancy that is uh, if uh, uh, an electron is already sitting in uh, this state. Uh, then no more uh, uh, addition can be done or it is allowed. Uh, and uh, so, this is that uh, 1 minus n i and this n i that you see I am sorry I forgot to put an equality sign and this n i that you see is uh, uh, it makes sure that uh, the occupancy can never be negative ok. So, it, it is uh, either 0 or 1. Uh, now, these uh, things obey anti commutation relation. And what are anti commutation relations? They are just like commutation relation that you are familiar with. Just to remind you that x p commutator is equal to i h cross, uh, that is a commutation relation, which means x p minus p x uh, is equal to i h cross. These are operators, ok. So, you can, if you want, you write it with a cap there. So, all these uh, uh, applies to the operators and so on. So, these are not uh, just not quantities that we are talking about and similarly there are like uh, all these uh, commutation relations that we are familiar with for the angular momentum which is 
i h cross l. So, this is like it encodes a number of commutation relation uh, for the components of the angular momentum. Okay. So, all these uh, quantities that are uh, fermions, bosons um, and spin etcetera, they have their own uh, commutation relations uh, like uh, uh, fermions have this anti commutation relation which I just said. Uh, the bosons obey commutation relations and uh, the spins have their own uh, commutation relations ok. They are uh, they do not match with uh, the ones for the fermions and the bosons. So, what I uh, mean is the following. So, this is how it is written uh, now uh, there are you know different notations that you might find, but mostly it is done uh, written with a curly bracket instead of a square bracket. Uh, but sometimes uh, a square bracket is followed by a plus sign this also means anti commutation ok. Uh, because uh, there are you know uh, opinion about uh, notations that people follow. So, this is equal to C i dagger C j dagger plus C j dagger C i dagger this is equal to 0 and similarly you have a C i C j anti commutation. So, anti commutation uh, very importantly you see that this plus sign is the main thing. Let me write it with a color so that you are sensitized about this uh, the main thing about the anti commutation relation. So, it is C i C j plus a C j C i and again this is equal to 0 and a C i dagger uh, C j. So, this is equal to a C i dagger C j plus a C j C i dagger and this is not equal to 0, but this is equal to a delta function a Kronecker delta uh, with delta i j. What it means is that if i equal to j uh, then this is equal to 1 that is uh, if you have C i dagger C i plus C i um, dagger C i then of course, this is equal to 1 and uh, so on ok. And uh, there are uh, you know various properties that we can uh, talk about the number operator and so on which you will see ok. So, uh, these anti commutations that you see are uh, they ensure that there is a uh, this a plus sign actually, actually uh, or the anti commutation relation ensures that there is a minus 1 whole to the power epsilon i and uh, that will take care of all the swaps that are affected in writing down the many particle wave function. So, we will write down the ket as n 1 n n this is equal to a c 1 dagger c 1 dagger and a c n uh, n dagger all to the power n 1 n n and multiplying by uh, or rather operating not multiplying it is operating on a 0 and this is actually a many body vacuum. Which means that it does not have any particles, uh, but that uh, particles means in the many particle sector uh, it is a vacuum. So, this is uh, how it is written. And um, how these are uh, so useful and uh, why would this we have to learn this is the following uh, when we try to write down 1 and 2 body operators which are all what are there in the Hamiltonians. You see uh, sort of in general uh, the scattering problems are all uh, one body and two body problem. A one body problem is uh, uh, that expresses the kinetic energy of the particle the body it is just one body how it moves and so on. Um, and uh, when you talk about two body problem then uh, we talk about the interaction between two particles ok. Uh, three body onwards uh, it is uh, it is almost unsolvable in most of the cases uh, because of the, the phase space that you have uh, for uh, which are defined by the momentum and energy conservation uh, uh, laws. Uh, they are not uh, enough to find out uh, you know deal with a three body scattering process ok. There are some specialized techniques which one does, but anything more than that uh, of course, uh, will be treated as a many body problem where you uh, would uh, talk about them statistically ok. 
So, uh, what is this uh, one body operator? Uh, so, one body and two body operators. Okay. So, uh, let me write down a kinetic energy which is equal to sum of the all the kinetic energies. Uh, so, I equal to 1 to n, uh, k is the kinetic energy and this can be written as uh, using uh, the complete set of states. Uh, we can write this down as alpha, alpha. Uh, so, this uh, will give you, I will tell you that uh, and this is that k and a beta, beta and so on. Okay. So, alpha and beta are single particle states and uh, these alpha, alpha, this is called as an outer product and uh, these uh, a complete list relation would give this and similarly for the betas they would give this as well. Okay? So, this is why the uh, you know this I should write it with a i and uh, so on. Okay? So, these are the, uh, so this is an i and so on. Okay, so uh, I just introduced this complete set of states and uh, then we can uh, write this down as uh, alpha and beta and i and so on and then we can uh, write this as um, uh, alpha and then k, k i and then a beta um, and uh, then uh, we can uh, sort of take a alpha and a beta and so on. Okay? So, that uh, we use this uh, and it is also alpha, alpha equal to 1 and beta, beta equal to 1. So, we uh, left multiply by a vector which is uh, alpha. So, it is a ket of alpha. So, that this becomes equal to 1 and we uh, use a beta here which becomes equal to 1 and uh, that is because we can uh, multiply a 1 here. And uh, so, these are written in terms of the matrix elements. So, these are alpha, beta and i and this is like alpha, k, i, beta uh, and c alpha dagger uh, 0. So, alpha is written in terms of c alpha and a vacuum and the beta is written as a 0 and a c beta. Uh, and this will also become equal to 1 because 0 is uh, uh, as much of an element of that Hilbert space uh, as any other. So, this is uh, so uh, finally what you get is alpha beta i is like a alpha k i uh, beta and a c alpha dagger c beta and this is a form of the one body operator. Okay? So, this is a number which is the expectation value of these uh, ki. Say for example, in a continuum sense, this is like minus h cross square by 2m d2 dx2 and then uh, you write down alpha and beta and then uh, this is the operator that comes out. So, it is a c alpha dagger c beta. So, if alpha and beta are say for example, uh, states that are um, they denote uh, say position or something. Okay, uh, then uh, you, this will be like a C i dagger C j and so on and so forth. Okay, uh, and similarly we can also write down this. I'll not uh, go in, but you can see this. We can write this down as um, for the potential energy. So this V is equal to alpha beta alpha prime beta prime. So this will be like a alpha beta and a v uh, alpha prime beta prime uh, and this will be like c alpha dagger c beta dagger c beta prime c alpha prime and so on. Okay? Um, so, uh, this is nothing but uh, the matrix elements uh, of this uh, operator which can be for a coulomb term this is like minus e square over r and uh, so this is like a alpha beta alpha prime beta prime. So, uh, the matrix element is this and the operator is here. Okay? So, the matrix element is given by this V alpha beta alpha prime beta prime and so on. Okay? So, this is uh, quite helpful and it will help us to write down uh, these um, tight binding Hamiltonians that uh, we will be extensively you know discussing uh, throughout this course. Okay?
then it will be made clear or rather it will be more clear that why we have introduced uh, these notations. And as I said that uh, they take care of this humongously large number of uh, swaps or the exchanges uh, of the particles or the signs arising from these exchanges and they are taken care of very uh, sort of in a very smart way. Uh, so, first we write down the Fox states and then we introduce the uh, these C and C dagger operators and their anti commutation relations. Uh, we are talking about fermions, so, but uh, similar way one can talk about uh, bosons as well. The formalism leaves uh, is exactly the same excepting that um, we would be talking about uh, commutation relations instead of anti commutation relations all right so uh, these are hamiltonians now we are slowly you know moving towards uh, condensed matter physics which uh, deals with hamiltonians for a given system its energy levels and so on and uh, these energy levels uh, are uh, called as the you know the band structure e as a function of k um, usually we uh, you know plot it as a function of k so, uh, so this Hamiltonian and let us talk about the Hamiltonian and relationship with topology. Okay. So, I just um, just a freehand drawing of uh, bands and uh, say one band is like this another band is say like this uh, this is the conduction band and this is a valence band and so on okay so this is e versus k for a given system i'm just uh, arbitrarily drawing some two bands and um, it can actually have many bands but uh, something that is too far away from the fermi level is not interesting at all because it doesn't contribute to the physical properties of the system the ones that are closest to the fermi level are only important for us to consider and uh, um, i mean what is meant by uh, near the fermi level so this is the fermi level so this uh, is called as a fermi level and this is usually the zero of energy so this line let me uh, then draw it with uh, another color okay uh, so this is the uh, Fermi level and something that is far away from the Fermi level are not interesting. Uh, the ones that are close to the Fermi level may be within uh, an electron volt or so uh, are important. Uh, by the way, this uh, one electron volt even if it uh, sounds a very small energy, um, especially uh, the students who are familiar with high energy physics and so on. Uh, we uh, for condensed matter people uh, this one electron volt is a very large energy in fact this is uh, roughly the energy that um, uh, the typical semiconductors like germanium or silicon uh, they have uh, or is uh, aluminum gallium arsenide etc maybe having a, a one point something electron volt one electron volt is uh, 11600 kelvin okay you understand uh, the enormity of these uh, energy uh, what I mean is that uh, one electron volt when you write it or equate it to kt k is the Boltzmann constant and put the value of the Boltzmann constant and uh, do all these homogenizing the units etc and then t comes out to be uh, close to 12,000 Kelvin it's 11,600 and that's a very large uh, temperature because uh, uh, you know the outside of sun is about 6000 kelvin or a little more than that so anything in the world uh, would you know melt uh, at uh, 12000 kelvin okay so uh, even though it looks like the one electron volt is a small energy uh, you cannot um, really you know uh, think of such a large energy in condensed matter systems okay all right so what i am trying to get at is that uh, suppose this uh, Hamiltonian is a function of some lambda. Uh, we have used this notation earlier where lambda is some parameter of the system and then lambda can be tuned. Say for example, lambda can be the electric field uh, or the gate voltage uh, uh, for a system for which you are writing down the Hamiltonian and then you are slowly tuning the gate voltage and the Hamiltonian changes. And say the Hamiltonian changes in this manner that uh, uh, 
uh, as a function of lambda it sort of there are only two levels that I wrote down and then you know it, it sort of uh, it uh, these two uh, energy levels uh, in the both in the conduction and the valence band they get slightly they change uh, slightly as it is shown here but uh, they do not uh, cross the Fermi energy. Again the Fermi energy is at the middle. Okay. So, now I am not uh, plotting it as a function of k, I say I am at a given k and then I am plotting it as a function of uh, lambda. Okay. Um, uh, do not mind this is just an example that I am giving, uh, they, the plots look same uh, versus k, uh, k is the wave vector by the way. So, let me write that, uh, k is the wave vector and lambda is some parameter. Okay, uh, some uh, parameters such as you know um, gate voltage or um, say uh, spin orbit coupling um, and uh, which can be tuned by using some external means etc. So, it can be anything and uh, I am just showing that uh, this uh, that a situation in which uh, it is changing with lambda. But let me show another situation where again I will show the Fermi energy with red and uh, so it, it happens like this uh, and so on okay. again as a function of lambda. So, this is uh, E versus lambda and so on. Now, see there is a big uh, difference between uh, this picture let us call this as 1 and let us call this as 2. Okay. Uh, in uh, 1 and 2, the difference is that uh, the number of levels, uh, the number of energy levels or the number of bands, uh, energy levels below the Fermi energy. changes in 2 uh, remains same in 1. Okay. So, 1 means this 1 and when I say 2 what I mean is this Roman 2 the, the figure I am referring to. Okay. Now, uh, let me um, sort of changes in 2 and remain same in 1 we underline and uh, this will decide that whether the system is topologically equivalent as lambda is being um, you know uh, is tuned this parameter lambda is tuned. Uh, in, in case 1 the system is in the same topological state uh, then uh, topological invariants are same. What I mean to say is that if you refer to the lecture uh, in the last uh, one that we have you know delivered uh, there the mug changing into donut. So, this will be uh, so mug changing into donut the systems are topologically equivalent I we said a uh, number of times that uh, a smooth deformation of the system from the mug to the donut leaves the system topologically same that is they are identical because there is just one hole it just counts the number of genus present in the system. So, where you hold the cup is the hole that uh, it transforms into the donut and um, uh, that is only thing that happens. Okay. The system uh, remains uh, topologically same. Okay. So, these are the uh, two inferences that comes out. Okay. These, uh, these two inferences uh, emerge from this uh, particular plot. This is just a uh, you know just a schematic plot uh, do not uh, worry too much about this I have just shown two uh, energy levels two below the Fermi energy two above the Fermi energy and so on. However, here uh, these systems are topologically distinct ok. 
okay because the hamiltonian for which energy is the the eigenvalue of the hamiltonian it uh, does not remain invariant rather uh, the number of levels below the fermi energy uh, as a function of lambda till this point there are uh, two uh, levels above and two levels below but this point onwards whatever that point is let's call that as lambda c that point onwards there are three levels below and uh, which is not the same as two levels so the system undergoes a, a topological phase transition which means that uh, there is a gap closing scenario that occurs which means that you are puncturing or you are uh, tearing something in order to create a different either a, to a differently topological system that is it has different topological invariant that is you are making uh, a mug into by somehow you know piercing it or breaking it or uh, uh, drilling some hole into it you are creating another genus that is it it sort of is equivalent to now a spectacles the pair of spectacles that uh, people wear. So, uh, they are uh, topologically distinct and this topological distinction is accompanied by a, a gap closing scenario. So, these are the two important features of these two things that or these two plots that I have drawn. Okay. So, I hope that uh, if you read more of course, you will uh, agree with me more, but I hope I have been able to give you this uh, analogy between topology and condensed matter physics that this is how uh, you slowly deform a system and if the system remains invariant that is a, sort of becoming a donut, then they are topologically equivalent which is uh, farther you know uh, corroborated or supported by this uh, Gauss bonnet theorem whereas uh, this system you have to make some uh, drastic changes to the system uh, and uh, in uh, language of condensed matter physics it means that there is a, a gap closing occurs you see the gap it was earlier gapped it was here gapped but that gap closes uh, with the Fermi energy at this point lambda c, this point is lambda c, this is what I mean as lambda c and um, uh, these gap closing occurs and so on. Okay? So, uh, then the system does not remain topologically equivalent that is a, a mug donut uh, a sort of you know in that sense the equality or the uh, similarity does not remain and uh, one actually uh, gets a different system. Okay? So, one uh, the Hamiltonian representing the two systems before lambda c and after lambda c are not topologically equivalent, okay? the topological invariant changes. Okay. So, uh, now this uh, topology uh, etcetera and its relation to uh, condensed matter physics can be understood even better by looking at the symmetries of the Hamiltonian. So, let us see what we mean by symmetries of the Hamiltonian. So, every day we come across a lot of symmetric objects uh, say for example, a, a circle is a very symmetric object if you sort of turn it uh, make a rotation by some angle uh, theta it you will be not be able to distinguish whether it is a earlier circle or uh, the, a new circle which is rotated by theta or say a sphere or there are many symmetric objects there are like uh, many things in nature which are symmetric. Suppose, uh, these leaves that you see which have got a you know symmetry there are uh, these alphabets many of the alphabets have got uh, you know symmetries uh, along various lines like for example, O has a symmetry about any of the axis uh, or uh, M has a symmetry about the vertical uh, axis and so on. Okay? So, these Hamiltonians also have certain symmetries and these symmetries dictate whether uh, as a function of lambda whether the system will undergo a topological phase transition or will remain um, equivalent to the original system as you you know as you change lambda. Okay? So, uh, these uh, symmetries are really distinct from the crystal symmetries 
uh, this crystal symmetries come in um, say all these uh, group theory that you might have studied in which uh, people talk about symmetries such as C4 V symmetry, C6 symmetry and so on and so forth. Uh, so, these are distinct than that uh, and, um, and there are a few symmetries which are really important and we will study them and uh, one of them is called as a time reversal symmetry. Uh, in short, we will call a TRS, uh, then we will talk about uh, symmetry which is um, it is called inversion symmetry or it is also called as a parity. Okay? So, this if you invert um, the coordinates or uh, you know, so how does uh, the system or the Hamiltonian behaves with the inversion of this that is r going to minus r, how does the uh, how does the Hamiltonian behave. So, that is called inversion or it is also called parity. Um, then there are uh, these symmetry uh, called as the you know the particle hole symmetry. Um, it is called PHS. Uh, it is short name for that uh, and this is uh, particularly important in the context of uh, superconductors and then we have uh, chiral symmetry and so on. Okay. Um, and uh, now this um, particle hole symmetry is also called as a charge conjugation symmetry. Um, and so on. So, uh, let us uh, you know start with the time reversal symmetry and uh, you might wonder that what is uh, reversing time. I mean is there anything called time goes in the other way. Uh, that is not true. Uh, what we uh, still do is that we want to understand whether the system moving uh, on the towards the right with the velocity v, uh, whether that scenario remains unchanged as the particle uh, moves in the other direction uh, with minus v. Okay? So, if uh, the direction of motion of a certain particle which is expressing uh, you know being expressed by the Hamiltonian, if uh, uh, that changes or that changes sign then what happens to the Hamiltonian, does the Hamiltonian remain same and so on. And we will see that uh, this has a very uh, significant um, you know effects on the condensed matter uh, <clears throat> physics because uh, there is something called Kramer's degeneracy that will emerge. Uh, just talk about it. You know. So, let us talk about time reversal symmetry. Okay, so, uh, I will not go into details uh, how the form of the symmetry operator comes, but I will just tell that this is the symmetry operator and try to you know, justify uh, the behavior of the Hamiltonian on that. Okay? So, under time reversal operator, it is usually written with a curly T, but uh, it is easier for me to write this straight T. Under this, it is written as uh, uh, T going to minus T. Okay? So, um, uh, under time reversal, uh, we are talking about uh, a system without spin. So, one system without spin degree of freedom. And you might wonder that uh, if you are talking about electronic systems or uh, even um, even bosonic systems, uh, the, they have spins. Okay? So, how can you ignore spins? Uh, and we can ignore spins in a variety of cases. Um, suppose uh, the uh, system is spin polarized, which means that it has only uh, spins pointing in the say talking about spin half, 
pointing in the, um, uh, the positive z direction. In which case uh, you have only that kind of systems and um, or, or they are pointing in the opposite direction. Okay? So, uh, now the system does not distinguish between the, uh, the particles pointing in the opposite, the spins pointing in the uh, positive z direction or negative z direction. If it does not do that, there is no term that mixes the spin one kind of spin to another. Uh, then you can just talk about one kind of spin and then uh, extend that analysis to the other kind of spin as well. And then the spin really does not arise into the discussion that we carry on later on. And uh, you just put a, if you need to sum over both the spins, you do a factor of, uh, put a factor of 2, but otherwise the spin does not, um, you know, uh, enter into the discussion. So, uh, uh, so under TRS, uh, this T, uh, a T small t goes to uh, minus t and um, uh, the Hamiltonian commutes with the time reversal operator. Okay? So, a uh, time reversal operator simply changes t to minus t and uh, the Hamiltonian commutes with that. Now, if you want to know that my uh, Hamiltonian may not only contain t, it contains x and p and so on and so forth. I uh, will show you the all these properties. So, a if it uh, is t x t inverse, this is how it is. Uh, the operation is uh, talked about or discussed, it is t x t inverse is equal to x, then uh, you have uh, t p t inverse is equal to minus p. So, uh, the x that is the position variable does not change sign, but p which is equal to uh, v over t or uh, dv dt or dp dt, I mean this is uh, like uh, it involves p is equal to mv. So, it is it has a v, v has a x by t since t changes sign. So, p has to change sign. So, uh, so this is another one and the important thing is that if it gets a i anywhere which is a i equal to root over minus 1, then it changes it over to minus i. Okay? So, and if you like you know t l t inverse that is l is the angular momentum uh, that also picks up a negative sign. Okay? So, uh, if you want a little more on that, it is not required, but then x and p is i h cross we know. So, this is equal to t i h cross t inverse and, and by uh, the third property or c property uh, t i t inverse will become equal to minus 1. So, this becomes equal to minus i uh, h cross which is equal to a minus x p commutator. Okay? So, um, x p commutator does not remain invariant. So, uh, let us go to this uh, f. Uh, so, that tells you that uh, if you have uh, a real space uh, second quantized operator t c j for example, t inverse. So, this remains same. Uh, however, T C J dagger T inverse that uh, also of course remains same, uh, but if you write it in the k space that is a wave vector space. So, T C k uh, T inverse this is equal to C of minus k okay? and similarly for the k. So, this is F G H and so on. So, uh, I am talking about this uh, C in the k space. Uh, we have not specified earlier what alpha and beta are. They could be uh, you know valid momentum states written in the momentum eigenbasis or uh, in the position eigenbasis. So, this is what it does. So, in this uh, thing what it uh, what turns out is that the form of T is equal to the uh, complex conjugation. Okay? So, k is complex conjugation. and um, t square that is square of that is equal to uh, 1 or you can write it as a matrix 1 because t is usually an operator. So, t square gives you 1 that is if you do twice. So, t acting on i will give you a minus i which is uh, in C and uh, then uh, when I do it on this other side that is t acting on minus i. Uh, t inverse that gives you i. So, t square becomes equal to 
uh, 1 you know uh, so this is like uh, if, if I uh, right multiply by t or left multiplied by t then that t square becomes equal to 1. So, this is uh, where k is the complex conjugation. This is slightly different uh, when a uh, system with uh, explicit spin degrees of freedom is there. Okay, and, and we are talking about spin half. Okay, so again, um, I mean, H and T should commute if a system has this means that uh, TRS is a valid symmetry operation. That means the system has time reversal symmetry. Okay. Uh, so, it is written as the operator is now no longer just k or the complex conjugation and um, uh, we also have uh, you know t acting on the uh, wave function will give me say psi t uh, and the psi t and psi are uh, distinct and uh, um, so psi and psi t uh, this is equal to 0 uh, both um, psi uh, has eigenvalues that is uh, uh, e as the eigenvalue and psi t also has e as the eigenvalue. What it means is that h acting on psi will give you e psi uh, and h acting on psi t gives you uh, e psi t. Uh, I am telling you all the results a priori and this is nothing but what is called as a Kramer's degeneracy. this along with this condition okay so uh, for a given system if the system it has time reversal symmetry in that case uh, uh, the wave function uh, psi corresponds to an energy e there is also the time reversed state which is uh, psi t here where uh, you apply uh, psi on the uh, i mean the time reversal operator on the psi and becomes a psi t then uh, the inner product of psi and psi t are is 0 uh, that says that these are orthogonal states psi and psi t and each of them have um, energy E that is h acting on, um, on psi uh, will give you E psi and h acting on psi t will also give you E psi t. Okay? So, the time reversal operator in this particular case has a form which is exponential i uh, s y. Um, this S y is uh, the we are talking about spin half I told you that so this is uh, has to be uh, it is a spin half operator y component of the spin half operator and this k which is a complex conjugation. And um, uh, if uh, you write down uh, you know S is equal to uh, h cross by 2 sigma in order to convert that into Pauli matrices then this becomes equal to um, e to the power minus i pi by 2 um, h h cross uh, h cross by 2 yeah sorry I forgot this h cross. So, it is h cross uh, and then a sigma y and a k ok. So, uh, this is the form of the operator uh, for uh, a system with spin degrees of freedom. So, if you take a t square now what is this um, exponential minus i pi by 2 h cross sigma y how to calculate this if you remember that it is a exponential i theta sigma dot n this is how the exponentiation of the Pauli matrices are done. Uh, sigma is the Pauli matrix uh, which has components sigma x sigma y and sigma z and n cap is just a direction this is equal to by using this de Moivre's theorem and properties of these uh, Pauli matrices it is equal to this and i sigma dot n cap uh, sin theta. Now, here you see theta is equal to pi by 2 and n cap is equal to y cap ok. So, the first term goes to 0 and the second term gives you uh, so this is a minus so there is a minus there is a I mean plus minus there is a plus minus. 
So, exponential minus i uh, pi by 2 um, h cross sigma y, you can take uh, h cross equal to 1 if you like. Uh, so, this is equal to, um, let me uh, take h cross equal to 1, that will uh, be better and this is equal to uh, i um, uh, sigma y and um, that is all, I mean at theta equal to pi by 2 the first term is 0 and the second term gives you sin theta by 2 equal to 1. So, it is simply i sigma y. So, t is equal to uh, i sigma y k. Okay? So, if you want to calculate t square, so this is equal to i sigma y k into i sigma y k. Uh, this is equal to i square um, and then sigma y square which is equal to 1 and then k. So, this becomes equal to a minus, um, I mean this becomes equal to a minus sigma y square and this is equal to a minus 1. Okay? Uh, so, that tells you that uh, uh, the system with uh, without spin degrees of freedom t square is equal to 1 and with spin degrees of freedom t square is equal to minus 1. So, the square of the time reversal operator changes as you, uh, you know, talk about uh, uh, spinner particles uh, that is spin half particles or uh, spinless particles. Okay? So, um, once again I uh, will show you the C j uh, up dagger uh, t inverse and this is equal to minus C j down and uh, t uh, C j uh, down t inverse this is equal to C j up. So, it tells you that if you have a, a j spin, uh, uh, I mean a particle with uh, at a side j with spin up, uh, it makes it uh, the spin becomes uh, lowered, uh, the, it is rendered lower and there is a minus sign and for the lower it becomes uh, up and uh, with no sign there. So, uh, now T uh, H of k, suppose you have a tight binding Hamiltonian where the Hamiltonian is written in the k space, this is equal to, so t inverse is equal to h of minus k. Okay? All right. So, uh, this is about the uh, time reversal symmetry and um, on the next lecture, I will be talking about the, um, the inversion symmetry and uh, particle hole symmetry and the chiral symmetry and so on. Okay. Uh, so, so, what we have given so far is uh, the first two uh, classes, they were concerned with establishing uh, uh, what topology is and um, the various, you know, uh, properties, etc. or uh, through various uh, uh, visual or uh, graphic and uh, demonstration, we have said that a system remains invariant if uh, it has the same, same number of genus as you deform the system. Now, what is its relation to condensed matter physics that uh, needs to be understood and uh, when we say that this deformation is nothing but you know driving the system uh, which is a function of certain parameter and then whether the, uh, the entire property of the system changes that is uh, the number of energy levels below the Fermi energy does that get altered. If it does not then the system remains uh, you know it, it is as a function of lambda. Uh, it goes into uh, or rather it, it remains topologically identical. Uh, so, a mug becomes a donut. Uh, but however, if the number of uh, energy levels are altered, uh, then you have done something violent to the system and uh, there the system undergoes a topological phase transition from. Uh, so, it will be um, a different topological invariant including a 0. Okay, so, which means that system goes from uh, topological to trivial that is uh, non-topological uh, when the uh, this uh, genus or uh, this uh, thing is uh, topological invariant is 0. Uh, we will uh, continue with this symmetry for just a while and then we will go on to materials which shows this topological properties. These are called topological insulators. Uh, most of the course uh, will be talking about topological insulators. Uh, Thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm.